if you look at people who are religious today who are not in conflict with science, they have viewed their religious texts as a spiritual, something that gives them spiritual support, not as a science textbook. The, the, inter, the, the conflict in society is when you have those who are still religious who want to use their religious text as their access point to understanding the natural world. And persistent efforts of the past to make that happen have just simply failed. The, the, the Bible does not work as a science textbook. In fact, Galileo knew this, and he himself was a religious man. He's famously quoted as saying, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. <laughs> People say, well, have you found life yet? No. Well, there, you know, that's like going to the ocean. This has been said before, taking a cup of water, scooping up and saying, there are no whales in the ocean, you know? <laughs> Here's my data, you know? <laughs> you, you need a slightly bigger sample. In the 1920s, which was a watershed decade in the history of science. In that decade, we discovered that not only our galaxy, the Milky Way, is not the only existence of anything in the universe, that there are other Milky Ways out there. That recently? 1920s. Did, was it just the op optics didn't exist for that? We needed a big enough telescope, and Edwin Hubble wielded all the glass that necessary to accomplish that back in the 1920s. He said, Hubble before the telescope was a man and, <laughs> and had his own telescope, the biggest of its day, and he made that discovery that there were these spiral fuzzy things in the night sky. We thought they were just local to us. There are whole other systems of stars, 100 billion stars unto itself, outside of our system. Not only was that discovered in 1926, 1929 he discovers that the universe is expanding which means it may have had a big, back then, it may have had a beginning. If it's expanded, that meant it was littler in the past. Well, there must have been a day when it was all together in the same place. Thus was born the Big Bang. Okay, so now, also in that decade, quantum, quantum mechanics, quantum physics was discovered. That is the science of the small, the science of electrons, protons, neutrons, particles, nuclei. At the time, you'd say, this is just the... This is just physicists burning tax money. Because who cares about the atom? I got my horse to feed. I got kids. I got, you know, you got issues in society. Yet it's quantum mechanics that is the entire foundation of our technological revolution. There would be no computers. There would be no, there would be none of what you take for granted. Your iPod, your iPhone, cell phones, the space program, without our understanding of the laws of physics as they operate on that atomic and molecular and nuclear level. And so the, the, the chemist has no understanding of the periodic table of elements without quantum mechanics. To them, it's just a list of elements. Quantum mechanics tells you why this column is there, and that's there, why this mates with that, and why that makes a molecule with that. That's quantum mechanics, and it's unheralded. You ask me if there's any discovery that has changed how we live, it is quantum mechanics. And I make, I make this point because I'm ready to, today you hear people saying, why are we spending money up there when we've we got problems on Earth? And, we, and people don't connect. The time delay between the frontier of scientific research and how that's going to transform your life later down the line. The, the, all they want is a quarterly report that shows the product that comes out of it. That is so short-sighted that that's the beginning of the end of your culture. So it's... I can't agree to the claims by atheists that I'm one of that community. I don't have the time, energy, interest of conducting myself that way. I'm perfectly happy going to see the rock opera Jesus Christ Superstar. I have Handel's Messiah on my iPhone, along with Bach's B minor mass and some of my favorite bits of music. This is what I do, and I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm perfectly fine with having religious people who live all around me. I, I'm not trying to convert people. I don't care. We're in a religiously pluralistic society. Most of what accounts for the immigration waves into this nation were people fleeing religious persecution in their hometown. And no one will deny the richness of this country as a product of the immigration that unfolded. I'm okay with that. Just keep it out of the science classroom. That's my little dog. Maybe it's a poodle. I don't know. <laughs> but it's a... <laughs> <laughs> so you ask me if I'm agnostic, I'm agnostic. And it's more that I don't really care. I, I don't, 
I don't want to have to spend all this energy, but I keep getting called out into the boxing ring, largely against my wishes. Congress is uh, considering pulling the plug on the uh, James Webb Space Telescope, which is the successor. Don't to get the me started. No, I want to get you started. This is the, the, the successor to the Hubble, and they say it can peer into the universe and maybe see the moment when the universe was born. I don't even know how that happens. Uh, but it cost $6.8 billion. Well, first of all, let's clarify what's, what the NASA budget is. The bank bailout, that sum of money could reach Venus. <laughs> That sum of money is greater than the entire 50-year running budget of NASA. Wow. And so when someone says, we don't have enough money for this space probe, I'm asking, no, it's not that you don't have enough money. It's that the distribution of money that you're spending is warped in some way that you are removing the only thing that gives people something to dream about tomorrow. Do you, you remember the 60s? You remember the 60s and 70s? You didn't, you didn't have to go more than a week before there's an article in, 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 in Life magazine. The, the, the home of tomorrow, the city of tomorrow, transportation of tomorrow, all that ended in the, in, in the 1970s. After we stopped going to the moon, it all ended. We stopped dreaming. And so I worry that decisions that Congress makes doesn't factor in the consequences of those decisions on tomorrow. Tomorrow's gone. You know what? We, we the, playing, the playing for tomorrow, metaphoric tomorrow, not the literal tomorrow. They're playing for the quarterly report. They're playing for the next election cycle. And that is mortgaging the actual future of this nation. The rest of the, country, the, rest of the world is going to just pass us by. Those who deny climate change, what do you say to them? Uh, the, I'm in a free country, which at least we believe, we, we tell ourselves we live in a free country. Uh, I, don't, I don't care what you believe. You believe whatever you want. The problem comes about is if you are in denial of an emergent scientific truth and you wield power over legislation, that's a recipe for disaster. The person on the street doesn't care about climate change or doesn't, you know, maybe I'll, we'll have a conversation, but I'm not going to lose sleep over that. It's when someone, an elected official, stands in denial of climate change, something that scientists have been telling them now for decades, and they're going to create legislation in response to that. What, that is the end of an informed democracy. The end. I love when they say, I don't know anything about it, but... But it's not true. <laughs> I don't know yeah. anything, but yeah. it's not and, true. And so, by the way, I don't beat politicians over the head. You'll never see me arguing with a politician. You know why? Because politicians, representatives, senators, they are duly elected by a community of people, the electorate. So if they want to say the Earth is 6,000 years old, it's probably because their electorate thinks so. And so as an educator, my task is to educate the electorate so that they could then vote people into office who can make sensible legislative decisions that can affect us all and not derive from their personal private belief system. What he did was invoke, he didn't invoke Zeus to account for the rock that he's standing on or the air he's breathing. It was this point of mystery, and in gets invoked God. This, over time, has been described by philosophers as the God of the gaps. Mm -hmm. if, if that's how you, if that's where you're going to put your God in this world, then God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance. If that's how you're going to invoke God, if God is the mystery of the universe, these mysteries, we're, t we're tackling these mysteries one by one. If you're going to stay religious at the end of the conversation, God has to be more to you than just where science has yet to tread. So to the person who says, maybe dark matter is God, if the only reason why you're saying it's because it's a mystery, then get ready to have that undone. Anyway. Um I read a book, Constellation of Philosophy. The main guy, Boethius, is condemned to death. He has everything taken from him. All he has is his reason and his sense of self. Not even that. But he attempts to console himself to this execution by reasoning that the world has order, that there is something that keeps things together. And he uses his reason to try and get to the root of why he should be at peace at death. The problem is, 
His source of origin is a belief in God. What would you do? Well, I, I don't know if I fully understand the question. I do know that uh, if he's about to be executed... Uh, How about you are about to be executed? Oh, I'm about to be executed. You have nothing except your knowledge and your, your knowledge of science, your experience. I would request that my body in death be buried, not cremated, so that the energy content contained within it gets returned to the earth so that flora and fauna can dine upon it just as I have dined upon flora and fauna throughout my life. Uh, they're, they're, they're embedded in belief systems. And what I look at is I see all the belief systems and when you line them up, they're not really compatible with one another. So whatever they're believing, it can't be a truth that applies to everybody because other people believe what they do with no less fervor. And so I sit back and as a person who's interested in, ob in objective truths and I say, well, it doesn't look like that's a path towards an objective truth. So let people continue to think and say what they want. But as a citizen of a country that is not founded on a on a, on, a, on a religion, it's founded with, with sort of a secular construct in a way that protects whatever religion you want to express. This is protected in the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't actually mention God. Right. R rather controversial in its day. And the, the, it doesn't mention God because they don't want legislation to tell you what God to worship. They knew this. They knew how governments can persecute people who had belief systems that didn't agree with the state. They knew this. So they created those freedoms. And so we have these freedoms. Go ahead. But if you're going to create legislation that has to apply to everybody, and you're now going to put your belief system into legislation, that is not a free and open democracy. There's no tablet in the sky that said it had to be simple to end up being complex. That's just a remarkable fact about the universe. So why not celebrate it? The fact that pi, pi, that, that pi, pi, right? Let's, let's say the numbers together. 3.14159. 3. We got a few. That's a, that is a nerd fest. We got a deep Beautiful. thing going on over there. Not I bad. That. Not bad. The fact that you take a circle of any size, a circle the size of the universe itself, and divide it by its own radius, and you get that number, that's beautiful. I have to pause, and I, I get misty thinking of this. <laughs> it's not. That's just, just another one. Another one. That the atoms and molecules in your body are traceable to the crucibles in the centers of stars that manufactured these elements over its lifespan when unstable on death, exploding its enriched guts across the galaxy, scattering it into gas clouds that would ultimately collapse and make a star and have the right ingredients to make planets and people. Which means we are part of this universe as I've said many times, and this is, goes back, the, not only are we in the universe, the universe is in us. That is a profound concept. And it was, I think it's the greatest gift that astrophysics gave culture in the 20th century.